Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to episode five of PGM India Mutual Fund presents Live Mint Amanda Justin Adda. That's of course a series of high power panels that we've been doing, looking at the world after the coronavirus. I'm Vikram Chandra, founder of Heritage, and today we're going to be taking a look at India among emerging markets. How does India attract more investment? attract more attention from across the emerging markets and is india really an attractive investment destination after coronavirus and we've got actually a spectacular panel for you today uh, we're going to start off by talking to harish salve one of the most noted uh, legal minds in the country former solicitor general of india of course we then have a panel that includes uh, janit kamal ahmed who's the Indi- who's the country director south asia of the world bank uh, Sonal Varma, who's the, uh, the Managing Director and Chief Economist India at Nomura, and John Praveen, MD and Portfolio Manager, uh, Q&A at PGM. Uh, PGM. And, and finally, we are going to be joined by none other than Mark Mobius, who's probably one of the most legendary investors in emerging markets uh, for the last 20, 25 years. So he's going to be joining us to take us through all aspects of what investing in India is going to be like and whether he thinks India is an attractive investment destination. So let's jump right in. Let's start off with Harish Salve. So what's the mood about India and how much interest is there in investing in India? And what are some of the legal issues around this? Who better to ask than a person I've always considered one of the finest legal minds in India. He's actually in, in, in Britain right now at this present moment, one of the finest Indian legal minds you could ever, ever hope to find Harish Salve, it's such a such a pleasure talking to you, Mr. Salve, as uh, as always. So, let me just ask you: You're of course sitting in London, and uh, you know, in, in in chambers from 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 what I can see. What, to your mind, is the when you talk to people about India and the Indian economy, and they are talking to you about the possibility of investing in India? What attracts them and what scares them? What is it? What are some of the things that you can hear? So uh, there is a lot of interest in India especially after the Prime Minister had announced the relief package which is going to come and the feeling that one of the ways India may pull itself out of this uh, spiral of low growth is by investing in infrastructure projects in a big way, give India the infrastructure it desperately needs and at the same time provide employment and provide an impetus to growth. So there is a lot of interest in that way. But at the same time, there is a sense of concern over certain regulatory, over the regulatory atmosphere in India. And that continues to worry people a lot. And unfortunately, we are not able to give comfort to foreign investors over the regulatory certainty and regulatory regulatory stability in India. So that has been one major issue. I mean, this farm bill, for example, this is such a huge, huge change. I consider it for the better. It was long due and it has been pushed through. And I'm happy it's been pushed through. Of course, there'll be a political rumpus about it. But activating this and making it work and changing the dynamics of the agricultural economy in India is huge. You're talking of a market of 10 lakh crores, 15 lakh crores cash market. So this is one huge thing which can, and this will be straight for the middle class consumer consumption, for the farmer sale. So this can be a great driver of growth if it is implemented quickly and if it is implemented in the spirit in which it is meant to be implemented. But obviously, as you can see, even from the way that the farm bill was done, potentially labor codes, you know, you know, which are which are also in the annual in parliament, but being done in manners that are that that some people will be scratching their heads about, right? Opposition not there is it being pushed through without adequate uh, debate? So, wh- how, what do you how, what do you make of all of that? Uh, let me tell you, uh, for a foreign investor's point of view, they don't care about whether the opposition is there or not there. That's a matter of internal politics in India. Yeah. What matters to them is this law has been changed. Now let us see how it is implemented. And does it create create an opportunity for investing in agriculture and agricultural related activities in India? And there can be a huge opportunity. 
And I think that is what is going to ultimately matter. Everybody knows in the Western world also here, there are populist issues. When, when the government addresses populist issues, they're screaming and shouting and opposition kicks up a fuss. Fortunately, the culture of ripping mics out has not reached this part of the world. But short of that, there is quite some political rumpus over measures. See, see how Brexit is even now getting back to being an emotional subject. So that, that by itself is not what deters investors. There is interest definitely in this sector. There is also a lot of interest in the ongoing growth in Indian infrastructure, which everybody feels has to be put on the front burner if we have to have in growth. The third interesting thing everybody is watching is the Chinese dimension in India, in the US, globally, with the US prevailing over the world to reduce economic ties with China. It opens up a lot of opportunity for other countries to go and invest and investors from other countries, funds from other countries to invest. All these are the pluses of India and people are definitely interested. Let me say, contrary to popular belief, people are definitely interested. So, the, the issues in India are very different. So let me come to this issue that you were referring to a short while back, because look, let's face it, you're somebody whose voice is respected by everybody here in India. And I know the government would, 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 would listen to you when you when you say something to them. When, when, you were, when you were referring a short while back to regulatory concerns, concerns about regulation, and you're right, you know, all the years I kept on going to Davos, uh, the people would always tell me, we're not worried about the Indian market. We're not even worried about taxation. We're not worried about incentives. We're not worried about any of that. The market is great. We know we'll eventually be able to do a, do a, do a great business out there. We are worried about things like regulatory flip-flops. We're worried about things like tax terrorism. We're worried about we will come and make an investment and four years later, somebody suddenly asking us questions about that. Is that what you're referring to? And is that the big area of concern? There are two or three big areas, Vikram. I don't know whether you are aware of this nuance. See, the Reserve Bank, that TL... RPO, the, the new repo auctions, did, were not as successful as they should have been, partly because banks are flush with funds and don't know what to do with them. The banks don't want to lend. If the banks have to be proactive, if the banks have to be risk favorable rather than risk averse, and sometimes you have to take risks in a economic situation like what we find ourselves so that we kick things forward. The banker has to be assured that his decisions will not land him in Arthur Road or Tihar. And that can be achieved very easily because there is, according to me, a completely wrong judgment of the Supreme Court saying every banker, including a private banker, is a public servant. The moment you apply the public servant and the banker gives a loan, and the loan runs aground, it's very easy to say you caused a loss to the bank, i.e. the government and the bank then become synonymous. So you lost, caused a loss to public funds and a private gain to somebody. That is why bankers today are very scared to lend. It has become a very bureaucratic procedure to do lending. That is one major deterrent which scares people away. After a person comes in and invests $4 billion, $5 billion, $10 billion, are you going to walk off with the, the ED going to walk off with the plant and leave you with the shell of the company? The government amended the law, promptly amended the law, but the ED refuses to give up. Now, these are the kind of things which scare people. The way the ED goes after people, the way the income tax's reputation continues to be of going after people, going after foreign companies, being thoroughly unreasonable, intrusive. That is why we have this issue. So if you had to advise the government, and as I said, you clearly are somebody the government government listens to you because you hear them making all the right noises, right? You hear when you hear the prime minister saying respect wealth creators, you say we must simplify it. New tax charter has come, which is pretty much saying that, you know, trust people, believe people. Why is it so difficult to say, look, India is not going to do any of this stuff anymore. Actually, if you think about it, and I, and I don't disagree with you, it's the fastest and the easiest way to get a lot of people to come and start betting in India and investing in India is to just say, 
we won't do any of this anymore. There'll be no tax terrorism. There'll be no regulatory overreach. There'll be no more of this stuff. And here we're putting it all in black and white and laws. We had, we had, like we decriminalized elements of the company's bill just yesterday. We will decriminalize a lot of other things. None of this will happen in India anymore. We will follow soft touch. If the government was to do that, you think that would dramatically change the amount of investment coming in? Vikram, the point is very simply this. We have to decriminalize our company law. And I know this sounds startling, but do we really need the enforcement department today? India's foreign exchange balances today are 500 billion plus. We are no longer at a stage where, for, where the foreign balances and foreign currency is a serious issue. What message will go today if we suspend the operation of the Foreign Exchange Management Act and disband the enforcement directorate? You could say the same for vigilance. You could say the same for some of the other areas that you're talking about. The government who comes in and says disinvestment, don't come and question that person 15 years later and say, why did you take this decision? This will, this will be a very stark message. Disband the ED. We don't need them. Second, we need to seriously, seriously rewrite our Prevention of Money Laundering Act. We have made some changes and the court, unfortunately, has given certain interpretations which are silly. For example, you have this, uh, the Securities Exchange Board Act put inside. And violation of that is a predicate offense. So if you file one return three days late, you violated a regulation. It's a predicate offense. You can be made liable under the Prevention of Money Laundering Law. Arrest. Do we even think of what we are doing? So, you know, this is what these are the small irritants. Now, if, if a client comes to me for advice and says, what are the risks? Don't I have to spell out these risks? So, oh, so you're saying when the when the investors, when foreign investors are coming to you and say, Mr. Salve, should I invest in India? What are the risks? These are the sort of risks that are spoken about. And can I add one more risk to that and get your legal opinion on this uh, as well on this, this show? One of the problems is that the charges that can be framed on somebody, right? Like you may not have evidence that X, Y, Z was done. Maybe there's evidence of, you know, I don't want to go to, go to, go to Riyadh Chakrabarti and the, and, and the drug, but the same thing. Like, let's say you have evidence that this was done, but you will put charges of A plus B plus C plus D plus E, which means that getting bail is difficult, which means the, the, the thing becomes far more serious. The provisions are more, 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 more draconian. And if at the end of the day, you find out six months later, one year later, two years later, that all those charges were not really required, there is no restitution. Your, your company is in trouble or you yourself are in trouble or you've been, you know, in, 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 uh, you faced a lot of harassment for no random reason. Is that also a concern? So charges are not warranted. Not just that. Today, since our criminal justice system has become so dysfunctional, we have substituted trial by evidence with trial by embarrassment. So if there is an allegation made, the media screams, scam, 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 scam. The agencies get active. I have a feeling which I cannot dispel that at times agencies come under pressure when the media is making so much noise. Yeah. What is it all about? Arrest, arrest, arrest. It's like a bloodthirst. Arrest, 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 arrest somebody, arrest this, arrest that, and then you close. And then everybody forgets about it. Three years later, when you're completely absolved of all charges, a little square, page three, column four. Look at one case in India. Sunil Mittal's company was roped in in a nonsensical charge. The other thing which we have to stop is this court monitored investigations. I have said so publicly, this is a complete violation of constitutional rights of the accused. And invariably, court-monitored investigations have ended badly. Whether you talk of the Hawala, where everybody was discharged, or you talk of the 2G, where people have been discharged in equity, this court-monitored investigation means that the agency feels they are under some sort of moral obligation to file charges, which is ridiculous. So look at what happens. Sunil Mittal charge, front page news. Airtel charge, front page news. Sunil Mittal discharged. And strictures against officers, page seven, column three. Yeah. So this has to stop. And there are ways of stopping this. First of all, there has to be a strong system within the agency. 
the moment a news appears if if somebody leaks that we've got access to messages sent by a to b where are they coming from obviously they are being leaked by the agency there has to be a robust system within the agency including a uh, ombudsman the officer who has leaked the information has to be sacked that very day and this is how india has to send a message that we are no longer you know we are not, not this kind of a noisy republic where we behave in this silly fashion yes if you have committed a crime you will be brought to book and we will deal with you firmly doesn't matter who you are but look at the samsung case i mean the the samsung dealership sacked somebody in uh, somewhere in bihar i think and he filed a criminal complaint to the chairman of uh, samsung in korea as the first accused and summons are issued to the chairman and the supreme court says yes of course he has to come I mean, what is this so you know these are the things that the government has to take on board and give right. full messages saying look all this monkey business has stopped you come and invest in india if you commit a crime we won't spare you but this regulatory harassment which goes on on a day to day basis this harassment of people this insulting of people this defaming of people this has to stop and finally one strong suggestion i have always been making to the ministry of information broadcasting set up a defamation tribunal make a law in which strict rules of evidence will not apply defamation cases decided in 6 months then let me see how the media runs its slander campaigns against people well mr salve one thing i will agree with you is that the media is probably as much to blame if not more to blame than everyone anyone else but seeing that this is about getting investment in and that seems to be one of the top priorities of the government we certainly hope that they are listening to you uh, on this program and uh, i'm i'm sure they will they will be calling you at some point to get your opinion please do repeat all of this to them and let's hope they listen to you i think you're right it will make a very very major change thank you so much mr salve for joining thank you so much for hearing from me let me now welcome uh jurid jurid kamal ahmed who's the india country director south asia for the world bank it's a it's a pleasure and a privilege to have you with us uh, sonal varma is managing director and chief economist india and asia ex japan at numura and john praveen is the md and portfolio manager qma which is a bijim company thank you all so much for for being with us um jurid the fact we just start with you and perhaps if we could get you to look at india and, and and place india a bit in a in a global perspective because obviously the crisis in covid is not only hitting india it's hitting a number of countries now you can keep arguing about which countries handling it best and which countries not handling it well but it is a it's a global problem what what's your sense of what india is doing and what india can do and what india should do and what lessons we can take from the others and i'll quickly go around and ask the others no it's a it's a pleasure to uh, to be here with all of you um you know unfortunately this is not one where we can say you know there is a there was a blueprint and if only india would have pulled the blueprint out and and applied it uh this is very different in terms of a global shock than the one that we had in 2008 which was the financial shock the financial shock hit i would say a group of countries about 11 or 12 and within that you began to see uh india and china grow so this was not a global financial shock the pandemic is global and the pandemic is global and is driven down growth everywhere but what is what is uh, uh really the big difference between the financial crisis of 2008 and today is that the response today is not a fiscal stimulus this response was a purposeful slow down of the economy globally because you wanted to flatten the health curve right the pandemic curve you wanted to slow down the economy make people stay at home the social distancing and this has happened around the world and when you look at how how countries have taken uh, taken a crack at that you really see it's very different united states a federal system really has allowed states to move ahead there wasn't a national framework you look at a country like sweden has a national framework but actually allowed citizens to engage and follow that national framework india created a national framework and a lockdown so fundamentally different ways in which uh, uh, which the uh, the story unfolded but across all three what I, what is it that you see in common the state has arrived in a big way you have you have budget deficits 
10% GDP, 15% GDP, Japan, 19% GDP. So the state is here. I India also, you see a shift in, uh, in a fiscal stimulus, monetary stimulus, number one. Number two, you find social protection being implemented across all countries to bridge the poor during this slowdown. And third is trying to protect some of the economic base, small and medium enterprise in the case of India, so that when the stimulus comes, they can all move ahead. Now, no one in this process, whether they went from public health to social protection to MSME, understood where the public health intervention ought to be. Expo, six months down the line, we recognize that it ought to have been a pure public health story. It was, it was about behavior change, perhaps more like the Kerala story, if you will. That's where the real, uh, real victory has happened. You know, perhaps the lockdowns could have been easier. Perhaps the lockdowns could have been timed better. But these are things that we're learning. But so to answer your question, I see the real difference is how the state has engaged the citizens in the process. So a U.S., Sweden and India has done it in a very different way, but all of them have gone through a fiscal expansion, monetary expansion, social protection, followed by trying to protect the economic base. That has been common across all countries. So now if I could turn to you, uh, you know, there are, of course, some mysteries because different countries have handled it in a, I don't think it's right, different countries have handled it differently. There is, of course, the overall uh, puzzle which, uh, you know, I have to say, is why is it that China really has not been affected more uh, than anybody else? Why just 83,000 cases in China? I mean, just about look at India, same population, you would see more than that every single day in China. So that's, that's a mystery. Bouncing back, Sunil, what's your sense of how, how is everyone going to bounce back if at all? And when will the bounce back come, if at all? Well, I mean, Vikram, uh, the bounce back, of course, uh, depends on, uh, you know, when the vaccine uh, comes through. But uh, at this stage, uh, you know, when, uh, well, investors, for instance, are looking at India uh, and comparing India to other emerging market economies, uh, they're basically comparing all countries on uh, three different parameters. One is, uh, you know, how resilient the country has been to uh, COVID-19. Second is uh, which countries have given the necessary fiscal survival or support package to support businesses and uh, households in terms of protecting jobs. And uh, third is which countries are more exposed to sectors that are more resilient uh, to a shock like COVID-19. Uh, and there, of course, uh, countries that are more geared towards technology sector are doing much better. So uh, on those parameters, uh, actually, India stands out as uh, amongst the more vulnerable uh, emerging markets. And I think uh, what does stand India out really is that the slowdown in the economy and the balance sheet stresses uh, were prevalent uh, going into COVID-19 uh, crisis. So the question as we look forward uh, are really two. Uh, one, if the private sector balance sheets are going to be much weaker post COVID-19, uh, does the public sector have the capacity uh, to take the economy forward uh, via more uh, expansionary fiscal policies because you do need, let's say, you know, infrastructure investment, uh, et cetera. And second, in a post COVID-19 world where, you know, the global economies, a number of countries are turning inward. Uh, there is, of course, uh, diversification from China that is uh, ongoing. Which countries will be able to take advantage uh, of some of this uh, diversification within emerging markets? So uh, I think from that perspective, uh, the fiscal side for India uh, does uh, come across as a weak spot. Uh, but in terms of ability to take advantage of some of the opportunities that are also coming up, I think uh, that is potentially an opportunity that is still there for ours to take. Okay, I, I'd, I'd like to draw on some of those themes in a couple of minutes, and I will. But John, if I could just get you and let, let me get your take on what you think of the overall overall picture. I mean, look, we are now halfway through September. You know, some people were thinking that by now things would be much better, but clearly they're not. Uh, you know, there's the stock of the vaccine. Who knows when it's coming? Like, who knows? It could be October. It could be November could be next year, we, we don't really know. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Vikram Chandra. Uh, I'm honored to be 
participating in this panel representing uh, PGM, the uh, Global Investment Management Businesses of Prudential Financial. So uh, just to step back, uh, I disagree with your uh, the statement uh, that uh, things have not changed. So since the crisis occurred, uh, hit the global economies in uh, the first quarter, I mean, we saw very, very sharp uh, plunge in economic activity and a big plunge in financial markets. Um, just to put things in perspective, um, during the financial crisis, GFC in 2008-9, uh, it took about 17 months for the peak to trough decline in the markets. In this crisis, it took one to two months for the markets to plunge 30 to 40 yeah. percent and for the economies to decline. Since then, we have seen a very, very sharp rebound in the markets and now we are seeing a recovery in the economies. So this was no doubt a very, very deep recession. The second quarter saw numbers, double digit numbers, record numbers in both developed and the emerging markets. But it looks like it is also going to be a short recession because third quarter, the current quarter, uh, the US economy, Europe, Japan, and many of the other emerging markets are all uh, on track to a rebound, a strong rebound. And wh why, why is this happening? Let me suggest a few reasons. One is that this has been a external shock as Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Junaid Ahmed pointed out, this is not because of any in inbuilt imbalances, at least in the US. Uh, Sonar did refer to some imbalances in other countries, but in the US and in Europe and all, we did not have any in imbalances. This was an external uh, exogenous shock. What that meant is that the underlying fundamentals in the US and many of the development con developed countries were okay. So. Because of the shock, lockdown activity came to a standstill, economies fell into a recession. But as economies started rolling back the lockdowns, we started seeing a recovery. Secondly, the policy response has been very, very aggressive, much more aggressive, much more faster than during the global financial crisis. And that provided a lot of liquidity. But People think that it's just the liquidity that is driving the markets. I disagree. What we have seen is that even before this crisis, there were some structural change going on. We were going towards increased use of technology and digitalization, use of cloud computing, 5G, uh, online retailing. All of these trends got accelerated. Um, there was a McKinsey report which says that that consumer and business adopt, adoption of uh, technology and dig digitalization got accelerated by five years in eight weeks. Yeah. And therefore, those countries and those sectors that have large technology sectors, they have benefited. I think, I think you touch upon a couple of very interesting points. So I think just pause you. Let me quickly get the others in on this. I think that's, that, 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 that there are some interesting points you're making. So if I could just get you in on that. So two ways of looking at this, right? Um, what John was just talking about, some of the policy changes. It is possible, and that happened, for example, in India, that certain policy steps were taken, you know, for example, agricultural reforms and other reforms in certain areas. Some reform measures were taken, a greater prioritization of health and healthcare, which may have been a long overdue uh, steps were taken. As, as John correctly said, technology sector around the world has got a certain boost. So in, in built in all what has happened in the last three or four months, are there certain factors that will actually aid in the recovery, help in the recovery, and long term may well eventually almost prove to be a blessing in disguise? Of course, it's a, you know, it's one heck of a disguise given all the, all the suffering that we've gone through. But in the medium to long term, there are some, there are some positives that will actually also emerge from a policy by another point of view. Uh, yes, um, but before Vikram, I uh, respond to that question directly. I think we need to remind ourselves that there may be a rebound, but when you've come 
down so hard around the world, a rebound won't put you back at the same level overnight. It's going to take several years to reach that, reach that point. And the second thing is, even with the arrival of a vaccine, I see the next two years as being very difficult uh, times. Because even with the vaccine, the distribution of it, the financing of it, actually seeing the effectiveness of it, this will, this will take time. So I think it's extremely important for us not to bet on a vaccine to solve our problems. It'll be one more element to help us uh, uh, in our path to recover. Now, coming to your question, you're absolutely right. I think one of the fundamental shifts that is happening in India is around social protection. In India, social protection was largely a rural story. Uh, but what was beginning to come out were a few things. One, Aadhaar. So I know who the poor are. I can identify the poor, the vulnerable, number one. Number two is bank accounts and cash, but 300 million women household bank accounts. That was the second. Uh, uh, second. Third is all these years of food security leading to huge, uh, huge reserves of food and a public distribution system that is, is, is global class at the end of the day, where a lot of leakages and so on have been, have been avoided over, over the years. And fourth is, if you will, a beginning of a linkage between central government and state governments in planning together a social protection system. You have that as a base, and what happened was COVID forced India to go where it was going gently, but to go very fast. One, urban social protection. Clearly the future of growth is in urban, Urban uh, labor needs to be protected. Second, on informality is huge in the labor market. You have to deal with the informal workers. So suddenly there's a movement to figure out how to link the informal workers into the social protection. Third is portability, right? Today, migrants move from one place to the other. That drives the economy. All these shifts towards a pan-India, dealing with urban, urban and informal sector social protection shift, I think is, go is going to be one of the big, big shifts. It's really interesting you say that because quite often, you know, before the pandemic, if you thought about the poor in India who may need, people who may need government support, you would have said it's a rural poor, right? The urban poor were really not spoken about. Migrant workers not really spoken about. Look at something as simple as you're talking about the PDS system, and that's correct, but ration cards quite often linked to the place where you come from. If you're a migrant worker and this pandemic in March, April was really underlined by the plight of the migrant workers and the urban migrant workers and urban poor in particular. So is that something which you think has really been underlined as a result of this? And let's not forget the large numbers of urban poor and migrant workers and things like now that one, one ration card irrespective of whichever state you are. That might be something else if we eventually will emerge with this from this. I think I think this is one of the pivotal shifts that is about to emerge in in India. I have to I have to add uh, that uh, this whole story of vulnerability. You know, India because of its past growth took about 100 150 million people out of poverty, but they but not out of poverty into a secure living, but into a vulnerable living. So any shock can pull them back into poverty. So this whole social protection is about not only the extreme poor, but also the vulnerable. And if you look at the vulnerable, they are in the urban area because India is urbanizing. This is the future lies in the cities of, of India and they are urbanized, uh, urbanizing. So this shift into a pan-India social protection system, which deals with the shocks and more shocks will come, I think is one of the one of the storylines that we will have to observe. There's a second storyline is revisiting and rediscovering what a pure public health looks like, right? Pure public health with community surveillance, uh, pandemic uh, responses, uh, laboratories across uh, across the country, rapid response. That whole machinery uh, was not as strong as it's now going to become because Ministry of Health is investing in, in that area. So two very important areas, one uh, being uh, social protection, the other is, I think, the reawakening of public health. Right. So now if I could come back to you now, you are talking about some of the fiscal stress. Now, many people, and we've done these shows before where many people have said, why not a bigger fiscal stimulus in India? Why 
why are we following you know sort of monetary policies and supply side and the rest of it and not doing a good old fashioned keynesian you know demand stimulus and it's still not really come do you foresee that and is that something important because the themes that you were also referring to spending more on healthcare spending more on education defense spending is going to be required now with the situation on the border and above all perhaps infrastructure which is something that india really needs so do you see that that this is the point now where all of that is going to come i would think so vikram i think uh, you know the broader framework of assessing what fiscal response needs to be broken up into two parts the fiscal response so far which has been more survival kind of measures to support businesses and uh, households to stay afloat and i would suspect that on this survival mode of fiscal support there's still a, a bit more that needs to be done for instance there are sectors like tourism hospitality that will be under water for a lot longer so they still require the survival uh, style of fiscal support but the second aspect of fiscal support of course comes is the you know keynesian demand uh, stimulus uh, and i think uh, the time for that is uh, sort of here now um, the question though is you know what kind of uh, demand stimulus do we want to give do we want to give a consumption stimulus or do we want to give a more investment uh, stimulus now i think you know it is of course quite important that this crisis is sort of an opportunity for the fiscal design to have something like an ur- urban you know rural employment guarantee in place uh, but this is not a durable solution to creating jobs i mean this is a fiscal tool you have uh, which you use uh, during the downturns and so it's a counter cyclical tool to create durable jobs i think yes to your question we do need more fiscal spending Uh, but it has to be directed in areas with the highest multiplier so you know as i was discussing earlier in terms of you know the infrastructure projects uh, how do we take advantage of the global value chains that are uh, getting out of uh, china can be you know create more opportunities uh, there you know what about more rural infrastructure can be increase more productivity and increase uh, you know rural uh, income so i think there's a lot uh, that can be done Uh, but having said that vikram uh, you know india is constrained on the fiscal side so we need to think smart uh, given the more limited resources uh, that we have so do we want to do more uh, privatization and redirect that uh, money into uh, let's say public infrastructure do can we are there savings that can be uh, found in existing fiscal spending which could be redirected towards areas that Uh, create better multiplier so we also need to think smart in terms of how to better use uh, uh, our uh, more limited fiscal uh, finances by right, john if so you know obviously the money is limited but if you were sort of trying to just take a look at india's investment opportunities in the sectors that india should be now sort of investing in or spending in it to the extent that there is some fiscal room what would be the areas that you would suggest there are two broad themes that are going on here one is you know well, actually three three themes one is the immediate uh, crisis uh, two the longer term structural issues and three the you the the china tensions and all of these things are probably going to provide various opportunities so in the case of india in in, in the short run through this crisis i think there has to be more investment in in infrastructure um and uh, and they and and given as as sonal pointed out given some of the constraints in terms about public finances a public uh, private partnership is probably going to be needed and that is probably an area where opportunities are are there are opportunities for investment secondly we are going through a big structural change even when the covid crisis is over people are not going to go that this trend towards digitalization towards uh, 5g use towards technology that is going to continue and yeah. india is probably well positioned among many of the emerging markets to capitalize on that so that would be the area where um, the investments are likely and that's what we are seeing in you know, all the investments that are coming into um, uh, online retailing and uh, i don't want to name companies but there a lot of money is coming into into the technology online retailing and digitalization field and the third theme is that because of the trade tensions with china 
there is an increased trend not only in the us but globally to move, move supply chains out of china into other countries and that's where india is probably comes into play so india has a good um uh, pharma industry chemical industries auto industry textile industries and these are the areas where there is likely to be investments now right. vietnam is not is is probably a country that is a lot under uh, under scrutiny as a candidate for um uh, supply chains moving but vietnam is a very small country the opportunities are probably limited india pro- probably provides a lot more opportunities in the supply chain relocation All right, Uzzat, that's a, that's an interesting point. If I could just ask you, you know, with, you, you obviously get a chance to look at a number of other countries as well, and you assess what they are doing, what they are not doing. So, anything that you are picking up, any lessons for what others have done in how they've dealt with with coronavirus, but also how they've dealt with the environment, which perhaps we in India should just look at and think about and say, okay, now that's that's an interesting that there's something there which we should think about internalizing. Uh, uh, that was, okay. Sorry, Vikram. Was that from me or John? Yeah, that, that's that's for you, John. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, you know, uh, the issue of environment uh, is a very important one because, in many ways, I think that COVID nineteen is a wake up call around climate and environment. Uh, a lot of people look at COVID nineteen and say that's the black swan, the unexpected event that happened. But uh, to be honest. COVID-19 was staring at our face, right? If there's a, a movie called Contagion that was produced a few years ago, yeah. it just seems to be unfolding of this whole COVID story. It wasn't that this is a black swan that arrived. This was the elephant in the room that was sitting there that we chose to ignore. Climate change and environment is one of those uh those shocks that are emerging and will continue to emerge unless we deal with it. And I'm beginning to see this uh wake up call in many parts of the world so in 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 the case of india i think there are some very important shifts that have taken place for example india's pivoting towards uh, renewable energy that the prime minister has really pushed is a very big shift uh, but this shift will find its success if only if our discom sector truly becomes an efficient sector so what lesson we're learning from elsewhere is that the the service delivery the utilities that deliver infrastructure meaning water utilities electricity utilities transport utilities have to be reformed from being traditional line departments to actually being corporate entities that deliver now that shift is something that australia did i would say two decades ago almost this is something that india needs to do if if it does that then it'll make a huge impact on the efficiency with which resources are used today transport should not just be about buses or metros it should be about mobility once you begin to look at mobility it really has an impact on climate change that's one example the other example i would give you give is what what everyone recognizes how do you how do you manage air pollution we know that air pollution is a lot of people will look at it as a technical solution Uh, if i could stop the fires burning in punjab uh, or if i could get uh, uh, cars uh, uh, to adopt uh, this kind of a filter or that kind of filter what i think we're forgetting that air pollution is a political economy story of governance you need to manage an air shed just like we know about watersheds and managing watershed we have to translate that into saying what affects an air shed in the case of new delhi air shed is 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 actually impacted by a punjab a haryana a delhi right it's a it's a cross uh, cross jurisdictional issue how do you bring cross jurisdictional leadership together to actually decide to manage air governance right this is this is something which california is one of the few countries that actually has a legislation on air shed management and i think this is something that india needs to look at and the the final point i'll make is we have looked at waste uh, usually as just a byproduct of growth and then slowly we said no no it's a byproduct of growth that we need to manage today we're talking about decoupling growth from waste that meaning we have to change the nature of the growth path because waste is not just a byproduct it's actually affecting our health 
and our ability to actually sustain that growth. Solid waste management is a major area that India has to look at across its cities. Well, you know, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more on a couple of the points that you made, and especially air pollution. We certainly hope that some days where the World Bank and maybe everyone else should look at. I think a lot of people forget that if some estimates are to be believed, a million people, more than a million people die in India because of air pollution every single year, which means that in the month of November, you may well have a situation that in North India, more people are going to die because of air pollution in November, which is coming up two months from now, than have died all year long because of coronavirus. So that's just, you know, one of the things that, that perhaps we have to think of. Okay, as I wrap up, perhaps last, last night, so look, your finance minister, we just appointing your finance minister here on this on this program. Your finance minister, what would you do tomorrow? If you had, if I had give you a choice of making three announcements tomorrow, which would pull India back up and get India up and running, what would you do? What would you say? Are you giving me two or three, Vikram? Pick. You're the finance <laughs> minister. It's your choice. Okay, uh, I think uh, three things. Uh, first, uh, you know, as I was saying earlier, uh, purely from a survival standpoint, I think there are still a lot of uh, SMEs, smaller firms in particular sectors that are vulnerable. Um, so I, I think the first thing is extending fiscal support to more sectors. Uh, second, uh, before we start planning long-term growth, uh, it's extremely crucial to fix the financial sector. Without the financial sector, you cannot run the economy. So, you know, whatever it, 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 a lot comes under the package of fixing the financial sector, but I think that has to be the second priority. And uh, third is then, uh, 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 I would redirect uh, the uh, public resources towards infrastructure. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, it is infrastructure, 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 because it both creates demand and creates supply. And whether you want to be a part of the global value chain, infrastructure is a precondition to that. So these are the three uh, top priorities for me. All right. Well, you'd John, have vote if you ran. If, you, if Sonal ran for elections, she would have my vote. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, but, but hold, the, hold that thought because we want to get you to give your, your suggestions as well and then maybe we'll have all of you contesting uh, one of them. John, um, as we reach the end of this very quickly, any, any steps that you would announce if you were finance minister tomorrow morning? Yeah, so what I would do is that uh, right now, uh, may, 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 you know, one of the things that the U.S. has done is that um, make sure that uh, the consumption is uh, su sustained so that the, we, the, the, the people on the, on, on the poorer segments who have lost their jobs and are not able to work, uh, they get some kind of an income subsidy. So for example, like what uh, Brazil did, what they did was they gave what is called as a Corona vouchers, um, which were given to the people so that uh, uh, the consumption is sustained until, uh, until the, the economy begins to recover. So that would be one income su subsidies. And then also, use the opportunity to try to build the infrastructure. That would be the other one I would do. And in terms about the RBI, I would probably try to, uh, to take steps to kind of uh, 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 make sure that the financial sector is, uh, uh, is in better shape. All right. So we essentially, I think, got two, uh, two votes so far for, for, for infrastructure. And I'd probably add my vote to that as well as one of the obvious things to do, uh, you know, uh, going forward. Uh, but... Junaid, I'm going to give the final thoughts uh, on the show to you. No, I think you'll, you'll see some common resonance. First is, I really believe that the social protection system of India, that has to be a big investment, not because it is a welfare measure, it's actually an investment in growth, because you're protecting, you're protecting the, the labor uh, and the human capital of, of the country. I think that's a very big shift. Second is, in infrastructure, I want to shift it from the physical infrastructure to systems that deliver services. So your electricity, water, transport, utilities, how do you make them actually become more corporatized and more service, uh, uh, service oriented? And the third area that I would uh, look at uh, is this is a time when India's fiscal, India's federalism needs to be taken to its next level. There is, the future of India lies in the states of India and how money moves from the center to the state and how states are catalyzed to do implementation, that's where the future of India will lie in all of the things that we are commonly mentioning. I would put a lot of effort in that. I mean, I, I would agree with you on, most, on, on, on all of those points. 
the last thing which you said perhaps easier said than done, especially given some of the some of the constant um, hostility, if not rivalry, if not fighting, which happens between center and state in various forms. But let let's see which of these. So all, Ranvi, thank you all so much. I think those are all excellent ideas and excellent thoughts of how uh, of what can be done. India in its position. Uh, uh, Obviously, the economy was already slowing a little bit before the pandemic hit. Now, this further drop has happened. But India does have the opportunity, if a lot of this is done, to come back, to bounce back, to grow again, to re-establish that preeminence, to once again become the fastest growing uh, you know, economy in the world. And let's hope that many of these steps are taken, which would assist in that. Thank you all so much. It was such a pleasure having you with us. All right, some really interesting viewpoints expressed there. Now let's go across to Mark Mobius. He's somebody who's been, who's no stranger to India, been investing here for 15 to 20 years and probably one of the most respected voices when it comes to emerging markets and which sectors to invest in. Let's, uh, let, let's hear what he has to say now. So Mark, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pleasure to have you uh, with us. Um, as, I, as I began by saying, you've obviously been keeping an eye on India for a fairly long period of time long before India really became the flavor of the season. Um, when you're looking at India today, and I'm going to ask you about the rest of the world as well and how, how you think the world is shaping up after coronavirus, but any specific thoughts on, on India at the present moment in 2020? How is it looking to you as an investment destination? Well, as you know, I've been very bullish on India for quite some time now. Uh, yeah. You know, we started investing, what, 50, almost 20 years ago. And I'm still very bullish on India, particularly now, because I believe the Indian market is really outstanding and is moving up at a very nice pace. The interesting thing is that uh, uh, in our portfolio, we have two funds. Uh, one is an investment trust and the other is a Luxembourg fund. India now is the biggest country in those portfolios. So it gives you some idea of what we think about India. And of course, the performance of the Indian stocks have done very, very well in our portfolio. So we're very happy with uh, what's happening. <clears throat> so, so Mark, I'm just going to take you back. As you said, it's, a, it's been a fairly lengthy journey when it comes to India for you. And obviously, because you got into the market so early, if I recall, the Sensex would have been some 3,000 at that time, and it's 40,000 right now. So obviously, you've ridden you know, a lot of the way, even multiple different roles that you've been, you've been playing over, over the entire period of time. What's the difference now? Because the India story is all also changed. There was a time when it was IT, then it was the manufacturing is going to come in, then it was something else, it was pharma. What, it was a consumption story. Which of those various aspects of India attracts you the most right now? Well, I think first thing you can say about India is that um, India has been going through an incredible economic and more importantly, a political transformation. Uh, a Modi is a sign of how Indians want to have a transformation of their society. And he speaks for those people who say that we need change, we need improvements, uh, particularly in infra infrastructure, and we need uh, to enter the digital world. In other words, we've got to do more in terms of becoming much more efficient. Uh, because as you know, a large part of the population in India are not part of uh, the modern society. So uh, these are transformations that are having an incredible impact. And we, of course, pay close attention to these changes because they have implications for what companies uh, we would want to invest in. So let's look at some of those changes uh, for a couple of minutes, if we can, and then I'll take you to the broader global, global market. You're right, there's a digital transformation that's happening. It's partly being driven by some of the cheapest data in the world, telecom companies. We've seen a lot of interest in India in the last two, three months in Reliance, Geo, and all the different investments that have come inside, and that part of it on which there's been a success. Is that still what you would be the most excited about, the digital aspects of India and the digital future and online payments and e-commerce and you know all of that? Well, that's one part of the equation, but not the whole. Um, what I'm particularly excited about, in addition to the digital transformation, is the infrastructure transformation. Uh, what we're seeing is a lot more spend in people's housing, in improvements of the housing and in infrastructure, roads, bridges, tunnels, etc. That's taking place throughout India. Uh, in a recent trip to India, I was surprised at the amount of construction that was taking place uh, on highways and that sort of thing. And it's not very well 
publicized for some reason. I don't know why, but many, not many people know about this. It's very important. You are speaking about the transformation that's taking place in India, and you're right. Look, it's a it's a far more politically centralized system than there was when you may have entered India first. I mean, there's really no opposition much to speak of. It's a weaker opposition. Uh, Narendra Modi and the BJP have got a lot of control and power. Some people will say the flip side of that is that you can sometimes have actions taking place like demonetization and others. Did that worry you? Because while there's a lot of change, there will always be some steps that won't go well. And demonetization, for example, was a hit on the Indian economy. Of course. I mean, there's going to be bumps along the way. Um, uh, in India, you have a, a very interesting and, of course, not it's not unusual uh, situation where you have your individual states that have their own uh, policies, their own objectives, that may not be in line with the center, with what New Delhi is asking them to do. So there's this constant uh, uh, back and forth with these forces. Uh, the good news is that the states are beginning to wake up to the reality that if they really want to improve, they've got to adopt some of the kinds of things that the a central government, the New Delhi, is asking them to do. So that I think that's a very important point. When you talk to investors, I mean, you talk to industrialists wanting to look at India, quite often they, and this is not a new grouse, has been their grouse for all time to come, is red tape and bureaucracy. Now efforts have been taken, obviously, to reduce some of that, that red tape and bureaucracy. But there are still quibbles about, you know, is there too much complexity around the tax system? And could you have a situation where overnight, you know, telecom licenses are cancelled or coal licenses are cancelled? Um, is that is that something that worries you and other investors you speak to or is it less now? Uh, it uh, worries us, but it's, I would say it's more better described as just an annoyance. Uh, it doesn't change our overall view of what we think of India and how we're going to invest. But it's true. <laughs> it would be nice if some of these things could be simplified and made more efficient. What in particular would be some of the areas that would give you a lot more comfort? I mean, look, you're already overweight in India, but what would give you more comfort to tell everyone this is perhaps the most exciting investment story on the planet, right? Now? Well, the first thing would be uh, reform of the tax system. Uh, for us, for example, we're subject to capital gains tax, which makes it very, very complicated uh, to calculate this gains, losses, back and forth. When you're running multiple funds uh, and you're in and out of the market, uh, capital gains tax calculation becomes much too onerous and expensive. So I would say that's the first thing that has to be changed. Uh, then I would say overall the, the, um, the movement of capital in and out of the country has to be simplified. So it's easier to come in and also get out. So this is, these are measures that are very, very important for foreign investors. Okay, so capital gains and e easier movement of money, that's that's done. Um, changes in foreign direct investment and others that have been happening now, the Indian government's obviously trying to say, given the pandemic and given some of the troubles with China, more of foreign companies should come and set up in India. Uh, there's all this talk about make in India and also self-reliant India, which is a slightly, you know, slightly different uh, uh, beast. Uh, what is your take on those? Is that something which you think could happen? Oh, definitely. I'm, one of the things I think that India is doing and has to do more of is look at uh, the success areas in the world. Who were the successful exporters? Uh, it started with Taiwan, really. Taiwan set up special export processing zones, making it easier to import raw materials and to export. Um, China copied that. And that's one of the reasons why China has been so successful in their exports. So I think India has to take a page from that book and establish these zones. I know they're already beginning to do that, but they have to accelerate that movement, make it much, much easier to uh, import raw materials, which can be processed and then exported. Right. So, you know, before I come to the rest of the world, um, you, you said that India uh, has, has become like one of the largest uh, holdings in your in your portfolio. Um, what would be essentially the themes? Is that the case, first of all, and by and do you see that continuing? And what would be the major factors you'll be betting on if you are taking a strong position on India? 
Well, there are three areas that we are particularly interested in. Obviously, software is one, uh, particularly companies that serve the local market in uh, software of various kinds. The next is healthcare, but not in the generalized sense, not pharmaceuticals, not hospitals, but more involved in the ancillary services, whether it be testing or supply of various types of uh, implants, that sort of thing. And the third area is infrastructure. That is uh, companies that are supplying uh, cables, pipes, whatever is needed for infrastructure spending. Uh, so those would be the three areas that are particularly interesting to us. Right, if I could turn now to your view on the, on the rest of the world. I mean, look, obviously we have seen perhaps one of the most spectacular tech rallies that in, in, in living memory, and especially from the lows of March to now, to see what's happened with especially the NASDAQ and the tech sector, it's, it's, it's really been a blowout rally. Do you see that continuing? I mean, is, it, is, is there some rationale for that rally because the world has changed and the, the business models of companies like Amazon or others are therefore far more, far more reliable and valuable now? I think it's quite possible that it will continue for one important reason, and that is uh, money is cheap. Uh, right now, interest rates are at historic lows, uh, particularly U.S. dollar rates and euro rates. And so people have a lot of money uh, that's looking for a home. Uh, and equities, of course, uh, is a very important part of this search, simply because equities will pay out a lot more than anybody can get in the bank. So, for example... Uh, if you look at the recent performance of equities, you'll see that it's been very rewarding for people that are holding equities. So you're seeing more and more people move in that direction. Um, so that's one of the reasons. Well, if you look at the, the same things that, that you're just mentioning, cheap money, low interest rates, monetary debasement, you know, the rest of the factors, the other asset which potentially has a major benefit from that is gold. And that's an that's asset class on which you had very strong views in the past. So what's, what's your view on gold now? I'm still bullish on gold. I think uh, everyone should have at least 10% of their portfolio in gold. Um, I noticed that India is one of the biggest importers of gold uh, yeah. in the recent last year, so this up to now. So uh, I think uh, it's very important that people hold gold. I'm not predicting that gold will go through the roof or will... Uh, go up another 50% or whatever. But what I'm saying is that uh, gold is a currency. And given the fact that all these other currencies around the world have been expanding at an incredible rate, uh, money supply is going through the roof, uh, you're better off with gold. The, the areas that you, uh, I, I read somewhere recently that you said that some of the areas that you should be a bit wary of, uh, if I remember correctly, mining, banking, and any company that doesn't have an internet strategy. Would that, would that sum it up areas that you don't like? And if so, why don't you like them? Yeah, generally speaking, that's the case because um, uh, we are very much uh, involved in ESG, environmental, social, governance issues. And frankly, uh, if you're going into a mining venture, you immediately have environmental issues at stake and also some labor issues as well. So it becomes a very, very complicated place to be if you're an investor. Uh, and now in the case of the banks, I know some people are recommending banks, that's fine, but uh, my feeling is that uh, banks in this day and age uh, with all the crises are sitting on incredible uh, amounts of bad loans. And now they're of course, the government is bailing out some of the banks, but generally speaking, it's a dangerous place to be at this stage. All right. Well, Mr. Mobius, thank you so much for talking to us. So the horse that you bet on 1520 years ago, which was which was India, and as I said, you were one of the first to do it. Do you would you be telling people that stay bet continue to bet on that particular horse for a while more? Oh yes, yeah, definitely, no question. We have no intention of selling down. In fact, we're looking at more and more opportunities in India. All right. Mark Mobius, always a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for being with us.